Good morning and welcome to the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. My name is Corky and I am with the Yolo Basin Foundation. And the Yolo Basin Foundation is the nonprofit organization that does uh, all of the education programs for the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. And we also do advocacy um, for the wetlands. Today, we're going to be sharing with you about the birds that are out here and you may see in the pond behind me. There's a variety of ducks. Um, we'll also be sharing with you some other kind of special things. Before we start that, I wanna tell you who's with me. I have uh, our docent, Carol, Carol Allen. Um, Carol's been a volunteer with Yolo Basin Foundation for about 10 years now. Uh, she has a degree from UC Davis in avian science and has worked in the field, uh, also hobbied in the field of birding for many, many years, as well as doing a variety of other very interesting things throughout her life. Uh, I also have my friend Nancy, and Nancy's title there is Spotting Scope. And what she's going to be doing is working our spotting scope so that we can highlight some of the birds that are out there in the, um, in the ponds that you can't really see too well because... We're looking at a broad picture. Um, and then also I have my friend Lucia. And Lucia is at home and her title is moderator for questions. And what Lucia is gonna do is she'll keep track of our chat. And if you type your question into the chat box, then um, Lucia will read it. And when the time is appropriate, she will let Carol know that there's a, a question and she'll read that question to Carol and Carol can answer it for us. Uh, if you can't find your chat button, usually if you tap towards the bottom of your screen or if you're on an iPad, it might be at the top. Uh, sometimes it's hiding under the more button uh, and then you just click on the chat and you should see a little box come up that says that you can, where, where you're supposed to type your question. All right, so that's what we're doing. Again, we're here in the YOLO Bypass Wildlife Area. And uh, we are with the Yolo Basin Foundation here in Davis, California. So I'm going to turn my uh, spotlight off and I am going to instead spotlight Carol, uh, who then will go on to the pond, if you would. Go to the pond. I can't see you. Okay. Uh, good morning. And it's a windy morning out here. Uh, we have uh, a few birds behind me, but I'd like to just kind of let you know where we are in the wildlife area. A lot of people might not have ever been here before, and this is your first time. And people who have been here uh, otherwise, uh, maybe you have some patience so that we can orient the new people. Uh, if you look behind me and to the north, you will see a highway with uh, looks like little white things moving along. And actually it's the I-80, the interstate on an elevated stretch that's three miles long that goes between Davis and West Sac. And that's an elevated stretch of highway. It's called the Yolo Causeway. And the reason we have the causeway is to keep traffic moving along from east to west or west to east when there's a flood event occurring in the bypass. So when you come to the end of the western part of the causeway, you can get off at Charles Road and come over to the le levee on the west side of the, of the wildlife area and enter in. And there are parking lots in the wildlife area that you can drive to. We have a five mile auto tour. And when you first come down, you go to parking lot A and there's a little kiosk at parking lot A with information. And if you want a map like the one that we have shown you, uh, you can stop at the Fish and Wildlife Office, which is just west of the entrance to the wildlife area on Charles Road. It's also on the website. Also on the website, thank you. Um, when you come in to drive the auto loop, there are 
designated parking lots along the auto loop alphabetically uh, named A through H. As you're driving through, if you have a dog, you have to keep your dog in your vehicle. We don't allow dogs on the wildlife area unless they're in a vehicle. And also if you have a bicycle, they are also um, not permitted. If you want to go on a walk down by the wildlife area, you can walk the west levee. So you could park up at the entrance on the, on the levee at the west and then drive a walk along the uh, top of the levee. And that's a pretty nice walk up there. You can see quite a bit. As you're driving through, you can stop at the parking lots. Several of the parking lots have uh, porta potties that you can use if you need. And also there are several of the parking lots also have designated hiking trails that you can take and walk and enjoy. Okay. So one of the things that we're gonna look at today are the, are the birds. We're looking at mainly ducks and uh, waterfowl. Uh, other waterfowl would be swans, geese, pelicans, and then there are also there are egrets and herons. So out here, um, uh, Nancy has a spot uh, a spotting scope for us, and we have in the spotting scope some pintails and some shovelers. Now, if you have, um, if you're looking at birds and you don't know about birds and you want to see birds. One of the things that I think is a thing to start with is ducks because they're so visible and they're very, very colorful this time of the year. In the fall, the ducks go into their breeding plumage and they stay in that plumage until spring. But they all migrate in from long, long distances up north to some as far away as Russia and they come across through Alaska and down the coast and they come here and the wildlife area is situated just about midway in the Pacific Byway. But for millions of ducks and hundreds of thousands of geese, there are, this is the end of the Pacific Flyway for them. Now, I, when I take people out and, and they wanna learn about ducks or they wanna learn about birds and they wanna go bird watching, but they don't know anything about birds, to not discourage them, I always try to start them out with ducks because ducks are very visible. They're very cooperative and staying in a kind of a relatively close distance from you that you can pick up with a pair of binoculars or a spotting scope. Now, in our spotting scope, I think we have some, uh, we have some Cinnamon teal, the wind's blowing pretty hard here, folks, sorry. Uh, we have some cinnamon teal and we have some shovelers. And one of the things is we have two classes of ducks. We have dabblers and we have divers. Today, I'm not seeing any divers out there, but we do have some dabblers. And up on the screen, we have an image of uh, the shovelers. Now, if you want to know what the bird is out there, a lot of the birds we identify by their bills, by their coloration, by their size, sometimes just by their name. So we have a cinnamon teal would be, you're looking for a duck that's a cinnamon color. But on the screen, we had a, okay, we have the cinnamon teal here. And it's a smaller duck. It's, it's got a cinnamon uh, colored body, a red eye, and uh, black feathers on the tail. They're the smaller of the ducks, and they, there's, other, there's other teal that are the blue winged teal and the green winged teal. And over here we have, I don't know if we're going to be able to catch them. We have some uh, 
pelicans flying, white pelicans flying right over us on, and we're trying to get them in the scope right now, but uh, they move pretty fast. They're coming right back over top of us. So I don't, there we're trying to get them. You're getting to see them a little bit. They're very silent flyers. And sometimes you don't even know they're there until they're there. They're white, big white birds. They're one of our largest flying birds in North America. Um, the only one that's bigger is the California condor. And they're even bigger than the bald eagle. So when the pelicans fly, they have uh, black tips on their wings. They have black under the wings. And when they fly, they fly just in a gliding um, flight, but they don't flap their wings and they don't call. So they're not noisy like the snow geese. So it's, it's sometimes they'll just creep up on you just like they did with us just now. And you don't even know they're there until they're almost gone. Sometimes you can see them off in the distance. And when they, when they turn and show you the bottom side and then they kind of glide and kind of show the other side they um, actually disappear in the sky for a few minutes and then oh, they're back again but they're ones that are really sneak up on you so you always have to keep an eye up in the sky to look for them okay we're going to get back here to the birds on the ground um, i think we have the shovelers now we have the one way to identify a shoveler is by its name. A shoveler has a bill that whenever the person who found them named them, he thought the bill looked like a shovel because it's, it's kind of a um, broad, heavy bill. And here you can see it going. And it's one of the dabbler ducks. It's just skimming along with its um, bill in the water. And what they do, and all the dabbler ducks to some extent have lamellae on the sides of their beaks. And they use these lamellae, they're like uh, the bailings on a whale. They filter out the water and keep the protein matter that they've uh, eaten, either aquatic plants or insects and macroinvertebrates. So this is a shoveler just skimming along the top of the water. But you can see the birds out here. They're tipping. Um, we can have maybe the scope pick up some birds tipping. The dabbling ducks do just what they say they do. They dabble in the water. And the two classes of ducks are the divers and the dabblers. So the diving ducks, they do exactly that. They dive. They go down about three, four feet. And they stay under the water for maybe 10 to 20 minutes, 10 seconds. Um, and then they come up. Uh, the dabbler ducks, they just kind of tip up. And so you'll see the, the tail of the bird up in the air and their head is down, scuffing around in the dirt in the shallow water, picking up the macroinvertebrates and aquatic plants. Basically, they eat the same type of thing as the diving ducks, except they do it at different levels, so there's not that competition for the food. So we have a nice picture of the dabbling ducks here going up and down. Now, the dabbler ducks, they have their legs positioned more towards the center of the body, and this enables them to, when they tip down in their head, they can paddle their feet and it keeps them in a vertical position. The diving ducks, they have their legs positioned further back on the body, and this helps to propel them through the water. Uh, their, their legs are um, positioned back towards the back of the body. Their feet are larger than the dabbling ducks, which allows them to propel when they're diving, they can push with those larger feet and get a um, good, strong swim going and, and swim faster. Okay, so now I'm going to. 
Okay, so now we're going to, we have another duck in there. It's a, a widgeon, American widgeon, I believe. And it has its black tail facing us and it's dabbling around. And then there's a cinnamon teal uh, just to the left of the center. And you can see the color on it. It's one of the smaller ducks. And it also has a what a, is a speculum. It has a blue iridescent speculum on it, uh, which is on the wing. And sometimes they'll flash that on a sunny day. You might be able to see that pretty well. The diving ducks have a hard time walking on land because their feet, their legs are positioned back on their body. So they basically, if they're gonna be out sunning themselves, they'll be right at the edge of the water uh, up on the land. They don't like to walk very far because they uh, tumble forward. The dabbling ducks, because their legs are in the, towards the middle of their body, they can walk pretty good on the land. And also when they take off, they can get a really good, strong push and it just shoots them up out of the water. Uh, but the, the diving ducks have to kind of flap their uh, wings really hard and then uh, paddle their feet. So they look like they're running across the top of the water for a short distance. So it takes them a little bit longer to get up in the air than the dabbling ducks. Another way to tell the difference is you might see ducks have similar coloration. And if we have a, we have two ducks out there that have white breasts on them. Uh, one is a pintail and one is a shoveler. So when we see just the white out there, we wonder, oh, what, what kind of a duck is it? So we know that two of the ducks have, we're doing just a little adjustment here. Two of the ducks. Oh, we have a question. Okay. What is a dabbler and a shoveler? A dabbler is a, it's a duck. It's one of the two classes of ducks. And it's the one that just tips down. It doesn't dive. It just tips down in shallow water to um, eat the aquatic vegetation and the uh, any macro invertebrates and some and seeds of the aquatic vegetation. And the other question was a shovel. A shoveler is a specific type of duck, right? And so when the, when the man came who, or the woman, whoever named the duck, the shoveler duck, they must have thought the beak looked a little bit like a shovel. A lot of people think they are more like a spoon bill. So they're, one of the things you can see if you're looking at and you see a very heavy bill on a duck, it's uh, the shoveler. Uh, another way to tell the shoveler is it has a big white breast on it. And the other duck out there that has a big white breast is the pintail. And I think I see a pintail coming to the edge of the, of the island. Maybe we'll get it in the scope. But here we have a, whoops. <laughs> we have some birds running around here. Uh, the cinnamon tail are pretty active right now. And there's a widgeon. Um, uh, the widgeon is the one Carol, with the Carol, white there, stripe on it. Excuse me, Carol, yeah. there is a question about coots. About the coot? coot? Yes. Okay. What, um, okay. talking let's, a little bit about the coots, I'll bring up a picture. Okay. Can I uh, just, let me, I'll sure. get to the coot in just a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we have a picture of a shoveler up in the scope and we're looking for a pintail to come by. But when they're sitting beside each other or in the water, both of them, both of them have white breasts. And the way you would tell them apart was by their name, you a shoveler. So if you look at the pintail, it doesn't look like it has a shovel. 
Uh, the pintail has exactly what its name says. It has the pintail. It has a long pointed tail. And it's like, I think, the regal duck family because they're so, um, they are like royalty. They, they're very proud ducks. They're, they're large ducks. They have they hold their head and their neck straight up. Uh, the male duck is in a breeding plumage and he has like a white bib on the front of his chest. And you can see the, the handles of the bib going up the back of his neck. And they have a blue bill this time of the year for breeding. The female shovel or the female pintail also has a uh, pointed tail. And she's very regal looking also. She just isn't as colorful as the male duck. The drakes or the males in their breeding plumage are very striking. They have a lot of bright coloration and they're trying to attract the female in the mating season to pick a mate. The females are more drab because they don't have to pick them. They don't have to have them attract a male. They pick the male. And they also want to be camouflaged in color so that they don't uh, stand out once they have a nest so that it keep from predators coming in. Okay, we have some, we have a lot of shovelers and the pintail have kind of disappeared. But there's a pintail right here uh, and a shoveler right behind it. So if you look, when the pintail comes up and turns this way, which they're not cooperating, uh, <laughs> they can, uh, you can see the white on the breast of the pintail and the, on the shoveler. So at that point, you look at the tail, you look at other features that would identify it. And one would be the, the pintail on the pintail and the shoveler would have that big, big beak. Uh, I don't see any green wing teal out here. We did have some green wing teal at the one end of the uh, island. And the green wing teal is small like the cinnamon teal. And they like to stay and feed up on the mud flats. They prefer the mud flats for feeding because they like the seeds of the plants, the aquatic plants that. Uh, grow on the up near the mud flats. They also like the moistened uh, seeds, so and they're they're a little bit smaller, so they like to walk up. And you, the other birds don't feed as much on the mud flats, but usually if you see a bird up feeding on the mud flats and it's smaller, you, it's usually a green winged teal. Now one thing about the green winged teal is they have one of the most distinct field marks. Oh, um, if we could see the green winged teal again in the image. But they have one of the most distinct field marks of any of the ducks. And if you see the white line on this image going from the shoulder to the wing, um, it's very thin, but that is surprising how far away you can detect that little white line. It's just uh, amazing. This duck also has a reddish head and a green stripe uh, on its head. So you can um, also look for that. But if you see a white vertical line on a duck, uh, you know that it's a green wing kill. It can't be anything else. Well, we're getting a lot of wind here, sorry. Um, um, we, we still have a question about the coots. Okay, I'm trying to, okay, can I hear the question now? The, just can I talk about the coots. Oh, about the coots. Okay, thank you for yes. reminding me. I'm sorry, I'm having a lot of wind in my speaker here, so I have to turn away. Okay, the coots are the black birds that have the white bill. They are not ducks. They are uh, in the rail family. And we have a picture of the coot uh, up and 
they're really kind of a striking bird. They have a silver back to them that it's black. <laughs> it turns out black most of the time, but they do have some silvery type feathers in the sunlight. Uh, the interesting thing about the coot is that the hunter we have, it's the most abundant uh, water bird we have because the hunters don't like to hunt them because they say they don't taste well. So they've actually used the coot to be an indicator species of toxins in, uh, in a wetlands area because there's so many of them. Um, yeah, I'm so, that's what I was trying to do. Okay, so there's, there's a, their feet are not webbed. They have lobed feet and you can see a picture of them here. And they have like little scales along the, the toes and they'll, those flip out. So that gives them a little bit of traction. Uh, and then whenever they, uh, when they're swimming or something, they can pull those scales back in. So they're just the toes. So they don't have any webbing. And the one thing is that they can walk on mud or walk on vegetation and not get stuck. Where is if a duck was walking on a, a soft mud and stepped down and the mud closed up over the um, toe, up over the webbing, they would have a hard time. It's sort of like you having a pair of flippers on and trying to get your foot up with sand all over the top of your flipper. So they, they used to be called mud hands because they are very good at walking on, on mud and walking in the vegetation. The thing is, if they, if something causes them to be alert and threatens them, they take off. But to take off, they need a quite a distance in the waterway because they don't have the web feet. They can't really take off really quick. So you'll see them, they have short wings and they flap their wings really, really hard. And they flap their feet really fast. And it looks like they're trying to run across the top of the water. And eventually, by the time they get height, the threat is gone. So then they all go back down. Um, I thought I saw a marsh hawk just flying by here but Northern Harrier somewhere. Okay. Um, having a hard time here. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's no, um, Okay, and this is, oh, this is the uh, coot eating. And the coots can dive. Uh, they eat uh, vegetation, aquatic vegetation, and they'll even uh, take small fish and uh, macroinvertebrate. And you can see the way the coot is swimming. He's kind of a, in a jerky swim. He doesn't swim nice and smooth like the ducks do. The ducks can swim nice and smooth. I'm gonna interrupt myself. We have some snow geese flying over. If we can catch it in the, if we can catch it in the uh, scope, I don't know. But we have a, one group of snow geese flying over. Usually snow geese, when they're flying, they're pretty noisy and you can hear them coming from a far distance so they don't uh, just come up on you and surprise you. But with the wind, we are not hearing too much of the snow geese. But there is some activity down here, so that's really nice. Um, um, <clears throat> there's another question about okay. um, if you could explain macro invertebrates. Macro invertebrates, they're, they're just the uh, 
very small, um, small critters that are like the, um, I guess the dragonfly larva, different types of larva from some of the insects are called macroinvertebrates. Uh, so they're just sort of at the bottom of the food chain. And um, I don't know if that's enough of a answer. Okay. Yeah, I'll chime in just a hair. Um, macro means more or less big enough to see, right? So yeah. we have a lot right. of things that live in the water. We have micro invertebrates, things that we yeah. cannot see without a microscope. And then we have the macro, which we can see. And like Carol said, things like the dragonfly nymphs and the midge larva and the scuds and many, many other kinds of um, invertebrates. And invertebrates are things with no backbone. And for the most part, we're talking about insects, uh, but there are other invertebrates as well uh, in the pond that these ducks may be eating. Okay, thanks, Corky. Now we do have other animals here at the wildlife area. We have a lot of mammals and uh, one of our visitors that we have every summer is um, a group of mammals that are friends with Corky. <laughs> and she, uh, she's head of our Mexican free tail bat program tours. Um, and they, the bats actually roost underneath the causeway, the elevated sections of the causeway. Um, the other animals we have that are mammals here are otters. We have plenty of otters, several families of otters. And if you're walking along and you you have to you happen to see a clear spot where you can look into the water, uh, some of the channels around uh, the wildlife area, uh, you have a good chance of uh, spotting a family of otters having a really good time. Okay. Okay, and we have other uh, other birds too that we have. Uh, we have birds right on on the trails. Sometimes you'll see different finches um, and sparrows. I know that a lot of people don't want to. deal with learning about the little birds because they're so hard to identify. But I found if you break them up into groups, just like we broke up the ducks into dabblers and divers, if you break up the sparrows into streak breasts and non-streak breasts, you'll find that there's not so many to learn. You'll just have five. And in this area, we have 10 different types of sparrows that you could possibly see. And if you break them up into streaked and non-streaked breasts, then you only have to really learn about five at a time. So we have some. We have a question about when the bats, oh, excuse me. We have a Go question ahead. about when the bats typically return in the spring. When yeah, the so I can, I'll take that. Um, this is Corky. And, um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave my, my camera going on the sparrows. If you, I don't know if you can see them poking around, but they're, they're kind of fun in the mud there. Um, so the ironic part is if you were to walk under the causeway right now, uh, well, actually you can't very well because there's a lot of water and you'd sink up to your knees in clay soil. But if you were to go under the causeway, you would see that there actually are many, many Mexican free tail bats that live here all year. Um, there's some things we don't know. Uh, one is we don't know the quantity that stay all year. Uh, the other thing we don't know is if they're the same bats that are here in the summer or did the ones in the summer go to the coast and the ones that were in maybe Grass Valley or Redding or someplace else come here for the winter. We don't know that. Um, we do know that Mexican free-tailed bats are native to Northern California and the ones that live in Northern California don't seem to leave this uh, Northern California 
We think they do an east-west migration mostly. And so um, it's more of a question of when do they become more active? And they become more active once the weather gets hot enough for the, um, uh, they become more active once the weather gets hot enough for the insects. These, the Mexican so, retails eat a high okay. quantity of moth he's and coming, mosquito. He's our way. And uh, you can see the fly out there of uh, the bats coming out from underneath oh, the, uh, the bridge. Right here you can see them really good. So Carol, what do you he's see? Standed right there. Carol, what do you see? Uh, we're seeing a uh, northern harrier female. And the northern hairy female is flying right over the top of the tulies. And that's one way that you can tell them is by their behavior, the way they fly, is that they stay low and they fly uh, just all over the top of the vegetation, soaring. And then they'll dive down on the vole or the mouse or whatever they're going after. So Carol, there's a picture here. Okay, see. that's it. Uh, it's flying out over the tulies and we have quite a few of them here on the wildlife area. Um, they like to chase the uh, coots uh, and they're very distinct because of the way they do fly. And also at the base of their tail, they have a big white patch. The females are dark brown and the males are gray. So this is a, a pattern that the females and the males are totally different coloration. It's uh, sexual dimorphism. Uh, we've, I think he's right here. He's right on the road, right in front of us. Or that's a different one. No, that's a that's not it. That's a seagull. <laughs> he came flying in there right from where the where the harrier hawk though went into the seagull came out. So the harrier hawks have a, a disc on their face, sort of like the owls, like a barn owl has on its face. And that way it finds its prey by um, having those uh, vibrations of the um, prey hitting that disc and they can zone right in on the, on the prey. So they're really good at catching prey. So we're gonna walk down here. We found a uh, marsh wren nest and you'll see the marsh wrens like to nest in the tulies and they'll bring in matter and then they take the um, strong man. They don't break off. This Can't okay, we seem, you. we seem to have lost Carol's audio. Um, so I'll repeat what she's saying. I think we moved too far from one of the iPads. All right, so she is showing us in the Thule. Uh, So tulies can be used for many, many things, including boats, which the native people would do. And here. Oh, so here's the nesting for the marsh wren nest. Entrance to the so there's nest. a little entrance yeah, there for the nest. Okay, I'm hearing you now. Cool. Okay. And so the birds just go in there. But as soon as they make those nests, they don't want anyone around. So if you're walking the trail and you come past these nests, 
you will just be uh, hearing a lot of chatter from these little tiny birds that want you out of their territory and away from their nest. But if you're lucky enough, you can see them flying into the nest or sticking their head out of the nest as they go to take off. The tulies have, there's some snow geese going over and they're really, you can tell the wind's really blowing. <laughs> the snow geese are really flying fast. Up on the top of the tulies, the blackbirds, the, the red-winged blackbirds, the yellow-headed blackbirds, and the starlings, they love the tulies and they have seeds that they like to eat at the top of the tule. So the tulies are very good. They give a lot of protection to the smaller birds. And the deer even like the tulies in the summertime because they can get down in the tulies. Uh, because tulies don't break that easily, they can step on them and walk through without pulling them down. And we're getting a lot of uh, talking from the snow geese now. But the deer and other uh, mammals, they'll go into the tulies to get away from the summer heat. It provides a lot of protection to them and also protects them from predators. We have uh, some predators here. We have coyote, we have mink, we have red fox. So there's all kinds of uh, animals that you can run into. And the secret is if you're quiet and you're observing wildlife, you might see some wildlife, right? There's a coyote on the coyote on the coyote screen on here. The screen. Okay. The coyotes here are pretty nice shape. They don't look like they're starving or anything. Um, they're pretty adaptable. Uh, they eat a variety of things. They, they uh, survive in a lot of areas, but this is perfect area for them. And we have several resident coyotes uh, that live here on the but they haven't, they usually just run from you if they see you, they'll dive into the tulies themselves. Yep. Another thing we found while we were just scouting around here today, before we got busy, was we found some owl pellets. And we have, let me just grab some owl pellets. I think this is where we found them. Okay, now these are owl pellets and they don't know what kind of an owl it came from. Um, don't, can you get my hand in there? So, we're trying to get the owl pellet so you can see it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I gotta move further away. Okay, there we go. Oh. Okay, so this is an owl pellet and it's probably either from a barn owl or a great horned owl. We have a lot of great horned owls as you come into parking lot C where we are today. Uh, we have um, a lot of times the great horned owls will sit in the tree along the road there and roost for the day. And the pellet is what they uh, form after they find their prey. They, they um, sort of roll this up and it's the stuff that they can't digest, which are the bones and feathers or fur of another animal. We'll try and break it apart here a little bit and see what we have in this one. But the great horned owls and the other owls, okay, looks like, a, I don't know if from, okay, here we are. There's some bones in here. And so they don't swallow these bones, they just, roll them all this material up and there's a lot of uh, fur in here. 
And there are people who take uh, these. This looks like a little jawbone because I'm seeing little teeth right here um, by my thumb. There's little tiny teeth. So it must be a jawbone or some little vole or something. Um, but they're fun for the kids to uh, take apart and try to figure out what what the owl ate for the night. Uh, if you're driving around and there's uh, some cottonwood trees and some willow trees and you see um, a big, like a cigar type, giant cigar with ears like a cat sitting near the trunk of the tree, that's uh, probably a great horned owl. Uh, the owls like to sit towards the trunks of the trees and the hawks and the kites like to sit out towards the edge of the branches. So you can usually tell if you're looking at a at a um, an owl or if you're looking at a hawk or a kite from distance until you get up there to verify it. But right now it's pretty windy. Um, and I don't see any uh, hawks or owls sitting in the trees today. Uh, they might be in, this is what we call a little riparian area where you have trees along the edge of a waterway that's moving. And they're very rich areas. They provide a lot of nesting and uh, food material and protection, especially for the little birds. That's protection from the, the larger ones because of the hawks or the falcons come in to get the little birds uh, they can't maneuver around those little branches as much as uh, um, Excuse little me, birds. Do. Carol, we do have another question here, and it's okay. about are there occasional tricolored blackbirds in the Thule area or large nesting groups in April to May? Um, I haven't heard of any. There is an, there, I, mean, I won't say there's never an occasion because there's always an occasion for <laughs> the blackbirds that come through. Uh, I haven't heard of any tricolored blackbirds recently, and uh, I don't remember any last year, but that doesn't mean that they don't come here. We get a lot of, we get a lot of uh, yellow headed blackbirds, and we have, uh, Tons of brewers, blackbirds, and the red-shouldered blackbirds, but the tricolored are a little bit uh, less in abundance. And I think that that I know um, I've seen them out in West Davis, um, maybe even as far as some of the farms in in Woodland or not Woodland, but. Uh, Okay, so the, a follow-up question here is: yeah, when, are the, when are the yellow-headed blackbirds present in the bypass? Okay, uh, they can be present some in the spring and early summer. I think uh, I can't remember the time of the year I'm usually here, but it, it's, uh, I think it's usually. Um, I would say starting now in March or April, because I know I've given tours out here before. And we've had lots of yellow-headed blackbirds during the tour. And I know that we cut off our tours at the last one in the 1st of June. So I would say in the spring is the time that we're going to see them. Uh, the one thing I'll say that we have out here that's really spectacular to see are the great blue herons and the great egrets and the there's also the snowy egrets and the great blue heron is, and the, um, the great egrets, they're about four, four foot tall and pretty large birds with really big bills. And we have a picture of them up here. This is a, um, the great egret and it's got a big long yellow bill, black legs and the, Snowy egret is about maybe about half the size of the great egret, and it's got a black bill, black legs, and yellow feet. So if you see a, a, a 
bird that looks like a small great egret, it, and it has yellow feet, and it's a snowy egret. So those are the three main egrets, or yeah, egret and heron that we have, but we do have a nesting population of black crowned night herons. And they nest usually off of parking lot C, off of one of the hiking trails, and you, you can hear them chattering and they're very noisy. Uh, a lot of people say if they, have, if they have a house near a nesting rookery for uh, the black crowned night herons that it makes their nights pretty unpleasant because they can't get any sleep with all the chattering from the birds. The great blue heron and the great egret, their diet consists of just about anything that's alive. So I've seen them take a fish, a uh, big catfish, and it takes them about an hour for the heron to throw it up in the air, position it right. They have to get it so it's going head first down and they will just flip and flip it and throw it back down in the water, stab it again, pick it back up. And it could take them anywhere from half hour to 45 minutes or longer. And then all of a sudden, boom, the fish is gone. And you see this great blue heron standing there with a big fat neck. So if you can have an opportunity to have the patience to stand, if you see uh, one of these birds stalking some prey, if you just have the patience to watch and if they catch it, it's a, it's a pretty spectacular event to watch one of these actually swallow something that big. Are there any other questions? I'm sorry we don't have that many different birds out here today uh, for you to see, but you know, the best time to come for migration uh, to see all different types of birds, the diving ducks and the dabbling ducks, is to come in the fall. Uh, the migration usually starts the end of September, and we start seeing birds getting here in, uh, as early as October. But the peak months are about the middle of November through the middle of January. And then as, as the weather starts to get warmer and the food supply starts to deplete, these birds have all eaten and, and gotten back their energy fat that they needed for their migration here. They've replaced it when they got here with all the food. And now maybe the food is starting to get a little bit more scarce. And we're gonna to start to see all these birds starting to migrate out. And it takes them uh, back to their breeding grounds in the far reaches of the North and the Arctic hmm. areas. Um, I do have another question about, sure. we do have another question about um, great horned owls. And um, okay. maybe it is simply, are there any great horned owls? Um, uh, maybe you want to talk just a little bit more about where they are. Where they are? Okay, where the great are. horned owls. The great horned owls on the on the wildlife area, like I said, are if you're going along the auto trail, anywhere where there is a clump of trees that looks like a, a line of trees. Uh, we do have a line of trees that come up to parking lot C, and as you're coming towards parking lot C, uh, if you look towards the the center of the trees, towards the trunk of the tree, if you see uh, a, an owl sitting or a bird sitting near the, the center of the trunk of the tree, that bird is probably a great horned owl. Uh, the, I've seen the great horned owls sitting up in the tree close to the trunk of the tree. And then a couple of branches below, a little bit further out, there's a barn owl sitting. And so long as a barn owl doesn't move and go anywhere, he's not going to be bothered by the great horned owl. But if he takes off for the night, he leaves a little bit earlier than the great horned owl or a little bit later. Yeah. Um, the uh, I think great we horned have, owl can capture them. We have time for one last question. Okay. Okay, I guess there's no other questions. Well, we really appreciate you 
tuning in today and uh, I you know, apologize for uh, not being able to uh, come up with more different species of birds. Uh, we do have shorebirds and they're coming in now. We have, uh, they're starting to uh, draw down the seasonal ponds and when they do that, they create mud flats and the mud flats are great habitat for migrating shorebirds. So this time of the year, in the next few weeks is a great time if you want to come out and observe shorebirds. And there's some uh, pretty nice shorebirds that are very colorful also, like the black neck stilts and the avocets. Okay, and I want to... better unmute there. All right, so I want to um, also wrap down. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm with Yola Basin Foundation. Uh, we do the education programs out here, and we have a couple other things that are coming up you might be interested in. Uh, in March, March 4th, we do have a program called Flyway Nights, and this month's speaker will be Charlie Russell, and he's going to be talking about these plants. There are so many plants that we see along the auto tour route, and often People don't know what they are. So this is your chance to find out what are some of those plants. And as he kind of says, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the poisonous. Uh, and you'd go to our website uh, to get your link just like you did for our wildlife area tour today. Um, we also, next month, we will be out at the Davis Wetlands doing a tour very similar to the experience today. And uh, I believe up on our screen is our logo with our website. And if you're interested in learning more about the programs or maybe you wanna come back in the summer and learn about the bats that Carol was talking about, uh, we hope to see you again. And thank you for joining us today uh, with the wildlife area tour of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. Have a great rest of your day.